Hare Krishna Guru Pro. Thank you very much for joining once again on the Monks podcast. Hare Krishna. Thank you for having me. I think today you know, we are discussing uh, a topic which at one level is so so common as to not be thought about in universal terms. We could say that the topic of Japa which you suggested at one level we understand the chanting of the holy names is universal but sometimes uh, we may not understand its universality as well as the way you titled it was the universal yes. and personal aspects. So, yes. do you have some structure in mind, or should I start with what I have, what I had thought of, and then we can take it forward from there? I'm okay either way. Why don't we? Why don't you lead the way, Chaitanya Charan? Since you always do such a beautiful job. I don't know about that. But thank you. So, you know, at one level, we see. In Prabhupada's teachings, that uh, he he while talking with uh, people from other traditions, he would say that any any sacred name of God or any name of God can elevate people. Mm-hmm. Yes. So in that sense, it was very very inclusive. But then we also have Harer Nama Harer Nama Eva Kevalam, and that is now. That is also using the name of Hari. Now, does it refer to a specific name? Bhakti Vinod Thakur also differentiates between, say, primary and secondary names of the Lord. So, is there uh, is there some gradation within the chanting of the holy names based on multiple factors? Now, one is which name we are chanting. Second is with what consciousness we are chanting. And third is also what conception we may have when we are chanting. You know, two people might be chanting the same name Krishna, but we know personalists and impersonalists can have very different conceptions of Krishna. And even among devotees, not everybody may have the same conception of Krishna. So, I had those three thoughts about chanting, you know, which name and what conception and uh, uh, what level of, uh, what motivation or what level of consciousness we are chanting with. So, so broadly, we could say this relates with Sammanda, Abhide and Prayojan. The Sammanda is more of uh, the philosophical conception. The Prayojan is the, the motivation. Why are we chanting? Is it out of love or is it of something else? And the Abhideya could refer to uh, what name are we chanting? How are we trying to fix the mind on the Lord? So, of course, this is a very rough, uh, bro- rough outline. But... Uh, Maybe if you like, we could discuss it from this framework. Yes, very good. Uh, this is a good way to start because I think it's important to understand uh, the chanting of the divine names of divinity. Um, that's a little redundant, divine names of divinity, divine names, uh, the holy names of God, however you want to say it. First, by understanding the the use of nomenclature, period. So some people call me Garuda Das. Mm. Now, that would indicate that that would be a devotee calling me Garuda Das. That that indicates a devotional relationship. Yes. Um, Some call me Garuda Prabhu. That's maybe more a little more respect a little more formality some god brothers of mine just call me garuda hey garuda you know mm-hmm. it, it's 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 more some devotees may even uh, uh sort of have fun with my name and okay. call me you know uh uh dr bird or something like that, because That's Garuda, of course, is, is the funny. name of a bird, right? Okay. So, you know, n- names, that, that what we call other people reflects our relationship with them. Hmm. Some people call me Dr. Schweig. Yeah. Well, then that, that acknowledges that I'm a scholar um, or a professor. Sometimes people will call me Professor Schweig, and they're using my legal name. Um, some people may call me Graham. Well, then that's an informal, more informal relationship of someone who may not be a devotee, but knows me in the outer world. Some people call me dad. 
Okay. okay. Yeah. That, that would indicate, you know, or father, what, that would indicate, you know, Chaitanya Charanji, if you started calling me dad, I would be a little concerned about you. <laughs> because that's not our relationship, right? Yes. Our subtle um, intentions and understandings behind names. So these different names carrying, in some sense, a particular rasa relationship with the other person. Beautiful. Okay. So just on that basis, we can begin to build an understanding of why anyone chants certain names of the divine. And yes, Prabhupada has said that if... Um, if you see uh, God as uh, Jehovah, then you can chant Jehovah. If you see it as a, um, a Christ, uh, then you can chant Christ you, uh, or Allah. <clears throat> and there are the 99 names of Allah. There's a similar kind of Vishnu Sahasranama, the thousand names of Vishnu. So the, the, the idea of a name is very, um, it's very powerful. To name something is to separate it from everything else. If I say Chaitanya Charanji, you know, then uh, I, I'm only referring to you and I'm not referring to anything else. Of course, Chaitanya Charanji uh, Das, oh, the servant of the feet of Lord Chaitanya. Wow, okay, so here's a devotee who is uh, surrendered at the lotus feet of, of Mahaprabhu Garanga. Wow, okay, so that's a privilege. So there's a connection between, I'm acknowledging a connection between you and Mahaprabhu. Wow, that's a, that's a beautiful name, okay? Um, my name, a Prabhupada named me after a bird, okay? But a rather unusual bird, I must say, uh, the carrier of Vishnu, okay? Um, uh, one who engages in sacred flight, carrying Krishna or Vishnu everywhere. Um, so these names have different um, senses and different, uh, um, you know, uh, connotations and so on. And the way we use the names also uh, can be, um, you know, uh, indic indicative, again, of a relationship that I have with the person named and the qualities or attributes of the person named. So it can all get very subtle, okay? You can get very subtle, but usually the names we use indicate the relationships that we have. You know, when you brought out the meaning of, say, Garuda or Gar Gar Garuda or Chaitanya Charan, I thought of two things. There is one thing is the name has a relationship with a particular object, a reality. And then the name or the person who is named has a relationship with uh, us. So it's, as you said, it becomes subtle. It becomes, so how are we relating with that object uh, or that person? And also, how that person or that person whose name relates with reality. Yes. So I think uh, one aspect of the holy name which we often talk about is that the holy, in the case of the holy name, the uh, the reference and the referent are non-different. Right. So I think that that is uh, implicit. I, I don't think that's there's much confusion about that. Although there is much, I would say there is. A lot of depth we can go into that subject also, but uh, I think here what you are focusing more on is in the not the object and the concept, or the you know again, the again well this is this is you know all, all a, a part of of um, the the process of naming or uh, um, I mean when 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 you're not here and I think Chaitanya Charan Das, there's a whole image that comes to me about Chaitanya Charan Das. Um, 
my interactions with him, my friendship with him, um, his uh, good intelligence on devotional topics. I mean, so many things come to me when I say Chaitanya Charandas. Now, mm -hmm. does the whole of Chaitanya Charandas appear? No, there are mm -hmm. parts of Chaitanya Charandas that I don't even know. But with the divine names, divinity is in some sense present completely within his name. So uh, there's, there's a, a um, it's sort of uh, an, an avatara. The divine uh, crosses over and descends into the very sonic representations of him. So it's an avatar. My, my name, if you say Garuda Das when I'm absent, of course you'll think of things about me, you'll remember you know, our relationship, but the fullness of my being is not present in the name. But with Krishna's name, the fullness of his being is actually present. Mm. And that's, a, yeah. that's a powerful thing, which is what you were just saying between reference and referent. Yeah. Yeah. But you also added an interesting qualifier that is in divinity is in some sense present in the divine name. So I think that also brings in something like a adhikar or a qualification. So the holy name is non different from the Lord. However, how much we realize it there will be a difference. We may not really feel the, the feel that non-difference. So in, in the case of any ordinary name, any names of those who are not really the divinity, no matter how much be our emotional investment. Hmm? So depending on how well we know a person, that much we may remember that person or that much that person will be evoked by calling out their names. And if right. you are very close, so the, so the degree of evocation of the person at one level depends on how much we know the person, but no matter how well we know the person, still the full person will never be invoked by their evoked by their name if they are not the divine. But in the case That's of the right. divine, so there is so the experience of the person depends both on like earlier you said, our relationship with that name or that person, yes, and the name's relationship with the actual person. That's so right. That's right. So, so you know, it, it's in w with regard to the divine names. There are really different relationships with the divine names. Um, one can look at the different kind ways of analyzing these relationships by first understanding the levels of advancement that a devotee may have. Okay. So at first, the relationship with the divine names and my perception, my reason for reciting or, or utilizing the divine names may be merely to uh, become um, acquainted with those names and to be uh, entering into a contemplative mode by chanting the names. Uh, as, a, as a Kanishta, we simply will hear the sounds of the names, will focus on the sounds of the names. They become almost an object of meditation. Mm. So in a sense, the names from the start, uh, we can treat as uh, intrinsically valuable sonically and um, a, a valuable object of, of meditation, just the names themselves, without knowing fully and appreciating fully the way divinity is saturated, you know, in those names, the the presence and the fullness of divinity uh, is in those names. But but at, at, as a Kanishta Bhakta, I'm becoming familiar with those names. Um, I'm I'm uh, you know, in a sense, saying you know, Oh Krishna, I don't know you, but I uh, I'm beginning to like chanting your names, you know. It's, it's 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 a new relationship. Um, if I've never met you before, I would say, "Excuse me, uh, what is your name?" You know that kind of beginning 
mm. uh, level of learning the name of a person. Because again, that distinguishes Chaitanya Charan from anyone else that I know. Mm. Otherwise, if I don't have a name, then I, I, in a way you don't count to me. But with a name, you count, you matter. Then at the Madhyama level. When you say I matter, are you saying that if I remember someone's name I, I, and I talk, address them by that name that indicates that I value them and if I forget their name, I don't value them? Is that what you're saying? Or? <laughs> in, a, in a sense, in a sense, you know, one of the reasons I don't like to go to uh, big festivals is because I have people coming up to me and say, Garuda Prabhu, Hari Bo. And I, and I, I'm scratching my head like, um, do I know this person? You know, and and <laughs> so yeah. it's very embarrassing, right? And so it may be like 30 years since I've seen the person, but apparently I had a bigger impact in his life than you know uh, he did in my life because he remembers my name. And I said, Prabhuji, I am so sorry. I don't remember your name. You look familiar, but I can't place you. Prabhu, you made me a devotee. Oh, okay, okay. And what's your name? And they would say their name. And then I would gradually remember perhaps, or hopefully. Uh, so again, the impact that I had on him uh, uh, caused him to remember my name even though I may look very different now, 30 years later. Yeah. Old man, you know, I was a younger man then, I'm now an older man, right? And so on. So, so the, the, the idea of recollection, the, the calling out a name, uh, naming someone, remembering their name, the name that belongs to them, it, it is in a sense, it's, it's a, 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 an activity of recollection. Mm. Now, with divine names, this is the deepest form of recollection. Deepest form of recollection. This is the deepest form of recollection. By we, once, we were once connected. Oh, okay. Yeah. To divinity. We became disconnected. And now we're becoming reconnected. You know, the true understanding of the word religion, and a lot of people don't like the word religion, but I've come to like it better these days because it comes from the Latin religare. And uh, legare means to connect, and re means again, to again connect. If you're going to connect again to something, that means that you were once connected and that you became disconnected and now you're reconnecting. That is exactly our position. <laughs> we, we were once connected, we became disconnected, and now we're reconnecting. Recollection. Recollection, okay. It's powerful. It's powerful. So now we're talking about, say, the holy name as a means of both recollecting and reconnecting, in a sense. Yes. You know, so when we talk about this, there is this, uh, both, uh, I could say from an insider concern as an outsider concern. For insiders, those are practicing the chanting, sometimes it becomes mechanical. And whether actually we are remembering the Lord or not, that becomes a question. Yes. And, uh, so, so and Chaitanya Charji, yeah. the mechanics of chanting... If, if I've never met you and I don't know anything about you, mm. saying Chaitanya Charn is going to be sort of abstract. I don't know the qualities. I don't know uh, Chaitanya Charn's like squared off glasses. You know, there's a, okay, he's got some, some glasses and, and he's uh, uh, shaven and, and he wears a, a saffron shirt. I don't know these things about Chaitanya Charn. Mm. Um, he sits in front of a curtain wall, you know, um, you know, that sort of, I don't know these attributes. I just know the name. Someone says, uh, Chaitanya Charan. 
Well, but who who is Chaitanya Charan? Well, you know, you'll get to know him as you chant. Well, you know, when we chant, chanting is not an isolated activity. We read in the Shastras. We study the Shastras. Um, it's um, uh, even in the Vedanta Sutra, it says, um, uh, uh, what is the, uh, the the phrase? I think it's... Uh, uh, what's that? No, no, none of those. Those are very, very well known. This is a less known one. It's a, I think it's, it's something like um, uh, uh, Shastra Bhavanat. Shastra so, Yonitvat. Shastra Yonitvat. Yoni is like the womb. Yeah, yeah, but that's another. That's another one. There's another one oh, where, really? yeah, where it indicates that bhava, we we attain to the to, to the feelings for the Lord through the shastra. I'll have to look that up for you, um, uh, okay. uh, Chaitanya Charanji. But in any case, the idea is that it's, uh, or maybe it's shabda. That's what I think it is. Um, that it's through sound. That we arrive at feeling. So is this anavritti shabdat? No, no, no. That's the last. Uh, that's the last uh, of, the, of the. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'm I'm just looking up my translations of the Vedanta Sutra, uh, and um, going through them. It's uh, here. It is here. It is three four twenty two, bhava shabdacha. So there is devotional feeling on account of the sound of sacred revelation. Oh, okay. okay. There's devotional feeling, bhava, okay, on account of the sound of sacred revelation, indeed. So the idea here is, you know, all manner of sacred sound, sound coming from the Shastras, sound from uh, repeating the names of, of divinity, um, it's all based on sound, and through sound, divinity is revealed. Mm -hmm. So it's a powerful statement in the Vedanta Sutra. I love that one, uh, the Bhava Shabdacha. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so here we are. You know, when we talk about the divine names, um, at first it may be mechanical. That's the Kanishta approach. Madhyama indicates that there is a connection. There is a connection between the chanter and the chanted. That there is an appreciation of my relationship with, with um, the, the divinities about whom I'm getting to know and to love. Um, the, uttama, the uttama level of chanting is one that's totally saturated uh, with love. So you see, the Kanishta is more mechanical. It's an introduction. The Madhyama is more knowledge of the very uh, divinities about whom I'm invoking uh, or, uh, you know, the, the, or evoking. Uh, and then uh, the Uttama uh, level of chanting is about lovingly calling out to the divine. And that's when, you know, and, and you know, I'm a professor, as you know, Chaitanya Jaranji, and every once in a while, I see a student in class and I can kind of tell that they're in love. They're in love with someone. Okay. And I'm sure, you know, if, if you, know, it, you know, it's like, I'm sure they're, they're taking notes from my lecture, but there's another part of them that's going, George, George. Oh, George, you know, just you know, he, 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 right using the vocative case, George, or if, it, if it's a man, maybe Georgette or whatever, uh, Georgette or whatever. I don't know. Um, just making up names now. But the idea is that, that that's the way lovers call out to one another. The Maha Mantra is a mantra of names comprised of lovers. It is the mantra of love. It's, you know, Chaitanya Charan, the Maha Mantra, 
it, it, first of all, it's called the Maha Mantra, the greatest mantra. Why is it so great? First of all, there is no mantra that I have ever seen or I know of that it, it doesn't have a syntactical structure or that stands alone is simply a bija. This is a mantra that has repetitions and it's all in the vocative case in Sanskrit. So this is a completely unique mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. There's a syntactical structure there, right? Vasude, va, Bhagavate Vasudevaya. But they're both in the dative case. Unto uh, uh, the, the, uh, the um, Bhagavan, unto Bhagavan, who is the son of Vasudev. Um, so the, the idea here is, is there's, there, the, it's in the dative case. Um, uh, the, the, it's, it, there's a, an a, a invocational bija mantra at the start with the mm -hmm. om, the omkar, the pranava omkar. Okay. This is a very common structure for a mantra. Very common. Um, there are loads of mantras, many, many, many mantras. And each of these mantras are generally uh, um, utilized at different times for different places and in different circumstances. Uh, just as the, as the Gayatri mantras are meant for uh, sunrise, uh, uh, midday and, and sunset. You're not really supposed to chant those mantras any other time. So there are specifications and these kinds of specificities are, uh, you know, just um, all over the place with mantras. I mean, um, certain mantras are, are, are meant for invoking uh, certain subdivinities, not the supreme divinities. So there's the ultimate divinity of, of Krishna and Radha and Krishna. But then there's the penultimate uh, divinity uh, such as Shiva. And then there's the, the quasi ultimate divinities of, of you know, Indra and, and, and so on. Vayu, Agni, etc. You know, I like so, the word quasi ultimate divinities. Somehow the word is uh, demigods have acquired a certain negative connotation, isn't it? It appears to be almost like demeaning those uh, those personalities. And I usually, when I talk, I prefer the word devatas. Devata. Quasi, yes. quasi divinity sounds better than uh, better than the word. Sometimes words change their connotations over time. Right. Like Rupad would use the word cult. Cult of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is spreading all over the world. We won't use <laughs> yeah. it now. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, the, the devata, uh, the word divinity comes from devata, right? It's a cognate. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and then, of course, the divine is a, a broader way, perhaps, to refer to uh, a divinity and so on. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, and then there's Ishwara. I mean, we have so many words, really, that can refer to divinity, but different aspects of the divine, you know, different aspects. Um, the Bhagavat is different than Ishwara. Ishwara is different than Brahman but one may contain something of the other and it can, it can get kind of complicated. I maintain that Ishwara is a combination of Bhagavan and Brahman. Oh. Isha, Isha meaning the governor, the ruler, the Lord, and Vara meaning circumference. So the center, the circumcenter of a circumference rules every point in the in the circumference. This is getting a little Euclidean, um, uh, with and and uh, um, within the field of geometry. But the idea is that that Bhagavan is at the core, mm. and Brahman is 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 the all. So at the core of Brahman is Bhagavan. Ishwara is connecting. B Bhagavan with Brahman. That's a beautiful metaphor. So we have many metaphors to talk about uh, the idea of the three aspects of the absolute. 
we talk yes. about sunlight and sun rays and uh, i use the example of say some delicious edible food like gulab jamun so we yeah. say first we may experience its fragrance yeah and then we go closer and we see its shape and then yeah. we experience its taste so like that okay. you know i think jeeva goswami talks about this in his sandarbha that how when people are experiencing brahman they are experiencing only the sat aspect of the absolute truth yes they are not yet experiencing the chit and ananda and when they experience right. brahmatma it is sat and chit and then when they experience bhagwan it is sat chit and ananda so yes. it's like the object is the same but are we experiencing its fragrance or its fragrance and its beauty aesthetic shape are we experiencing the fragrance shape and taste all so i i like this gulab jamun uh, uh, uh you know example this is very good i mean you, know, you of course we've all heard the example of um the train uh, at night all yes. you see far away is the light and it comes closer you see the actual you know um uh, engine uh, car and then when it stops uh, you know you see the, uh, the 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 engineer in the train you know yes. you know that kind of, but i like the gulab jamun thing better that said that that makes sense because it's rasa you know it's taste yes. Yeah, I like that. So, but I, I like the Euclidean example also. What you said about uh, circle, because what yes. it also conveys the idea is that, in one sense, the circle is everything, but there is a center of the circle, and center has its importance. That's right. So, so Brahm, and but, in terms of the visual imagery, also, Bhagwan as the center of Brahman works perfectly well, like the sun and the sunlight. Yes. So then, when you say Paramat or Ishwara links, uh, are you equating more or less Ishwara with Paramatma in that sense? Mm. Um, Paramatma really is sort of. You could also use the example of Ishwara um, uh, with instead of Bhagavan at the circumcenter, you could say Paramatma. Okay. Uh, because of course, Paramatma is on the way to Bhagavan. Yes, and we know that within the devotee's heart, where Paramatman resides, that ultimately uh, a devotee sees not Paramatman but uh, but Bhagavan. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the heart. So they're they're very closely linked. Um, it's beautiful. So yeah, then, yeah, yeah. So we were talking about the divinity and various levels of the manifestation of the divinity. and uh, the names which you refer to in relation names. to the names yeah right so that's you know our chanting reflects our relationship with with the divine if we chant mechanically then our relationship with the divine right now is simply introductory and mechanical i mean when i when i meet someone for the first time um or or to I not even meet someone i hear about them and i just hear their name that's all i know oh. it's kind of abstract you know it's kind of abstract but when i meet them i go oh oh look at look at him or her look at that what a fine looking person okay i see that they actually have a form not just a name so nama rupa right nama rupa and then oh oh they like to play tennis oh well, my gosh that's their lila okay so nama rupa lila okay and uh, and and where are you from anyway oh you're from new york okay nama rupa lila dama dama okay <laughs> so, so in other words so this is so just to know nama now although uh, you know rupa lila dama is all collapsed in the name of divinity whereas it's not collapsed in my name or your name this is the difference the difference between uh names in this world and then a uh, names for divinity um there really is quite a bit of difference between um the the uh, uh reference and the and the and, and the referent um so the the uh with divinity this is the this is the um marvelous path of bhakti to enter more and more and more into krishna's divine being as as it's stated in the gita when enters into his 
divine, his being. Uh, it's wonderful. And part of that being uh, is, of course, his name and his form and his lila and his, and his dhamma and so on. Mm-hmm. And of course, you can add in there the guna, the attributes uh, and so on. But, but yes, I mean, the name, uh, of course, you know, we are, when, when the Maha Mantra, I'd like to, okay, Chaitanya Charanji, I'd like to point out some special qualities of the Maha Mantra in the Upadesha Amrita, verse five. Mm. This is the first, this is the first place in the short 11 verse text of the Upadesha Amrita that the holy names are, are mentioned. And it first starts out, O oh Krishna, when one calls out and sings this name, one should honor such a person within one's mind. Now, it's interesting. We can, we can sound the name of Krishna by ourselves in japa, in the ostensibly lone activity of japa. But we can also do this in kirtan. Now, at times we do japa together with other people doing japa. And, um, uh, and, and this is one way one can be a little bit more electrified in one's practice, especially if it's more mechanical in the beginning. But in kirtan, one of the things that enlivens devotees in kirtan and, and uplifts one's practice of the chanting of the holy names in kirtan is that other people, other devotees are relating to the holy names, perhaps at higher levels. And so one is kind of drawn into that in kirtan. Okay. Now you, you don't measure this. You can't say, uh, uh, Prabhu, before you chant, uh, which level are you on in the chanting of the holy names? You know, are you chanting purely? Are you, you know, this is not a concern. The holy names are always pure. The question is whether our relation to them is pure. So holy names are pure. So I can hear someone mechanically going, you know, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hmm. The names, I've just chanted it mechanically, but the names themselves are pure. Our uh, um, uh, interaction with the names may not be pure. Hmm. So it can be more like the Thomas Aguna, you know, that's the, that's the Kanishta start. It's dark. It's mysterious. I don't really know exactly what I'm doing at this point. I haven't realized it. It's not a natural process for me yet. I don't know the person uh, wh- whom I'm invoking. You know, I don't know that person yet. How strange is that? Um, of course, a Kanishta in the in the uh, temple setting will know that, you know, this is Krishna. You see Krishna in the in the Archa Vigraha form. You know, this mm-hmm. is who you're invoking. You know, <laughs> so that's um, a an excellent introduction to the names. You're just being introduced to Radha and Krishna. So you want to get to know them more. So you you call out their names. But when one is, is living their whole lives on the devotional path, then calling out their names takes on different uh, dimensions. So one of the things I'd like to point out about the Maha Mantra is not only that it's a unique mantra among all other mantras, but as Mahaprabhu himself says in the second uh, verse of the Shikshamritam, he says there are no hard and fast rules for chanting. Mm. So that's, that's, that's one of the things about Krishna's names that make, make chanting his names different than chanting all other names. Mm. So, so that on the one hand. On the other hand, we have 10 upper odds. Now, wait a second. I'm getting, I'm getting jerked around here. There are no hard and fast rules. 
And now I've learned there are 10 offenses. Well, the, the 10 offenses are not rules. They're things that we tend to do. And every one of the 10 aparadas, and we call them offenses, but what, what is an aparad? Aparad means moving away from the proper mode of worshiping and loving the divine. Aparada. Rada means worship or love, loving. And, and apa means away from. To move away from. What is that? What does that directionality consist of, though, Chaitanya Charanji? In every case, what is implied in all 10 aparadas is a form of reductionism. Reductionism, beautiful. I never thought of it that way, but yes, that's exactly what it is, isn't it? When each you, form, you, you each aparad okay. is to reduce something very special to something not so special. Look at the first one, the, uh, uh, to, to blaspheme the devotees. Blaspheme means to make something much less than what it is, to discount it. Mm. Discount, yeah. Okay? Um, uh, to consider uh, the names of the demigods, like Lord Shiva, right, etc. cetera, um, to be equal to. Well, again, you're reducing the holy names to something less mm. than what they are. It's not that um, chanting the names of, of the penultimate deity of Shiva is a bad thing. No. But to reduce Krishna's names to that is not a good thing. It's moving you away from the rasa with Krishna. To disobey the orders of the spiritual master. Well, I mean, okay. So why would someone disobey? Well, because one is simply reducing the, uh, uh, the, the requests of the spiritual master as something that's not important, when they're extremely important. In fact, Prabhupada says the instructions of the spiritual master is the life and soul of the devotee. So if it's not your life and soul, then, then you know, what are you doing? Why do you have a spiritual master, right? So again, another form of reductionism, right? Um, uh, then of course, to blaspheme the Vedic literature. What does that mean, blasphemy? See, blasphemy and idolatry are two ends of the same spectrum. Idolatry means I make something more than what it really is. And blasphemy means I make something less than what it really is. Beautiful. Human beings are forever caught between these two. So true. <laughs> so, 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 Chaitanya, so if I say Chaitanya Charanji, ah, he's nothing but a brahmachari. That's blasphemy. Chaitanya Charanji is much more than just a brahmachari. Brahmachari is a secondary concern. Ashram is a secondary concern. Yeah. Chaitanya Charanji is a wonderful bhakta. Now that's more powerful. See, that's more, that's truer. Chaitanya Charanji, ah, he's just a brahmachari. So you are, in a sense, uh, talking about, say, blasphemy and idolatry have very strongly religious connotations. But the underlying principle applies everywhere. Say so yes. it's uh, either we overvalue things or we devalue things. That's it. So, so we, we, no, we, we, well, we, we can overvalue things, we can value things, and we can undervalue things. Yeah. That's the spectrum. I think undervalue is more precise than devalue over here. It's like conscious act is done over, over and under. That's so, right. For example, you know, if, if somebody says Garuda Prabhu is just an academic scholar, that's, that's right. Uh, that's one part, but that's that's far from the most important part. And to reduce it to that one part, mm. yes. So, is yes. there any? In fact, in fact, curiosity? you know, uh, is there any way? I never thought of. I thought of idolatry primarily as a 
Abrahamic concept. Is there a is there a Vedic or Sanskrit word for something like idolatry? Even blasphemy, I don't know. Aparad is not exactly blasphemy. No, so it's not. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so even 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 even, uh, even the word offense is is a uh, is still a connotative sense of yeah. what aparad means, literally. You know. Yes. Um, yeah. So, but I never heard that offense being I never heard aparad being translated as blasphemy. It's not exactly the same. It is. Uh, That's right. Okay. So I think those. Word but, but, in a sense, but in a sense, it's closer to blasphemy than offenses. Yeah. That's offenses is almost like the after effect. I mean, look, blasphemy, look, aparada, okay. to make less than loving, to, to perform thing, to, to do something that makes something less than its true loving intent or, or a true loving function. Um, uh, Aparada, in, in a way, is it reductionism? Is, is it, it? It's not a pretty word. It's not an easy. You know. a, I have among all the things I've heard, reductionism. We may use the word materialism or material vision, but reductionism yeah. conveys actually it very precisely. What's happening? Thought, what's happening? It conveys what's happening. Yeah. So it, in fact, it conveys everything: the attitude of the person, their and the consequence of that action. So reductionism conveys a, it's almost like reduct, the word reductionism is a more inclusive word. Yes. Which, which doesn't convey just the action or the, con, like offense conveys more the uh, consequence, as you said. Yes. Take offense or don't take offense. That's right. But uh, it's not that Krishna personally takes offense. It's just that our action itself is offensive because we are, we are undervaluing Krishna. That's Krishna, right. Krishna is a vengeful God or the holy name is vengeful. It's just that we, when we, when we undervalue, then we, it's, we deprive ourselves. It's not that somebody is depriving us or somebody is punishing us. It's just by our undervaluation, we are depriving ourselves. That is correct. Yeah. It's, it's a very beautiful explanation. So, you know, earlier, maybe, maybe you want to go to this later or we can just mention this. See, you know, we had a whole podcast on please criticize me. So, <laughs> yeah. so we discussed that how you know, criticism can help us to improve, and yeah. uh, it is important for all of us to have that. Um, now, in that, we had a brief discussion on which you know, aparad in terms of offending people, offending devotees specifically, or even offending in the general human beings also is an offense. So, there, what it would mean is criticizing is. Okay, this is this is what you are, and this is this is what is not being done right, and you can improve this. Or but that is the whole attitude in criticism, the way you used it. But in uh, in offense, it's not the the mood is not to help a person improve. The mood is more to make a judgmental pronunciation of what the person is. Yeah, is it that what is that what would the difference be, or is there something more to it also? Yes. So, so yes. So, constructive criticism is one thing, and it, it doesn't. Uh, if it's constructive, then it is avoiding reductionistic kinds of uh, claims. Um, okay. But and, and 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 of course, constructive criticism implies necessarily dialogue. If I'm constructively criticizing something you've done, Chaitanya Charanji, mm -hmm. but I never tell you I'm doing this behind your back. Then it's if I, yeah, if I'm That's unwilling, right? Then it then it becomes what what may have been intended to be constructive can also be destructive, because what you're doing is you are um, uh, 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 convincing others of what you've done that is worth criticizing. Um, if I say, well, I've actually spoken to Chaitanya Charanji about this, and he agrees that blah, 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 and so on. And But it's another thing, if I do this behind Chaitanya Charanji's back, 
maybe with the best of intentions, but one has to be very careful. One has to be open to dialogue, most importantly. Dialogue is the place for constructive criticism to be transacted. Now, that said, when others refuse dialogue, by others refuse means the, dialogue. sorry, others means the the giver or the receiver or either of criticism. Either, either, either. either. Hmm. When 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 either one refuses to engage in dialogue, namely the person who is criticized for doing whatever or saying whatever, and the person doing it, if either one it fears dialogue does not see the value of dialogue, that itself is a reductionistic act and blasphemous, therefore. Oh, okay. So criticism itself can become reductionistic and blasphemy afterward. It's not that criticism intrinsically can be. So we could say there are two, three possibilities. One is if somebody criticizes with no intention of having a dialogue and then it is then it is problematic i think like the way you mentioned and the, the incident that if somebody is speaking something about you on facebook you know why speak it over there you know i'm ready to talk with you you approach them so that means if a goes and speaks about b to c or d or e without ever trying to seek any dialogue with b uh, any kind of uh, response from them also then yes. that would go in the direction of destructive criticism and that would be that would be blasphemy that would be aparad so if a if say also we could say if a does this and then b refuses to respond then is it uh, then who is committing aparad over there is it uh, i would say if b responds and then a, a again refuses to engage yeah then I think once we get into technicality, that may become a little complex. But I understand yeah. your overall point that if there is, if there is no scope for the criticism to be made constructive, then it is more likely to go toward offense. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. And and the word offend, to Again. offend, um, is is to hurt, is to hurt. Um, again, the word offend is used all the time and it's merged with all kinds of stuff. So let's not use that word. Let's just say what it is when constructive criticism is offered, but there's refusal on the part of the other person to engage in dialogue. Then in effect, ironically, it's not the person who offers the constructive criticism that's hurt. Uh, the, the, that that is hurting the the person criticized, but it's the person who is criticized, but can, in, within all good intentions. But the person refuses to engage in dialogue. In that regard, he or she is hurting the person offering constructive criticism. Ironically, <laughs> so you know it, it. It's all about dialogue. It's all about samvadam, samvadam. You know, it, it, it's like it's like um, if if Arjuna and Krishna on the battlefield, you know, uh, Krishna offers uh, you know some sympathy, and as he does in the beginning of the second chapter, and you know there are uh, seven verses before you know six verses before Arjuna says shishya teham sha you know shanti maham prapadam something to that effect. He said, "I am your student. Please instruct me." I submit myself unto you. I mean, he could have said, um, you know, I'm not your student. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, learn from you. And I don't consider you my teacher. So I'm bowing out. I don't want to hear from you. But Krishna had some constructive criticism. He said, Hey, this is not too becoming for a, a kshatriya, by the way, you know, <laughs> you know, he even he even laughed a little bit in a loving sense, not a mocking sense, a loving sense. And Arjuna had a subtle criticism of Krishna when he was complaining about what was going on in front of him. He said, you know, he addressed Krishna as Madhusudana, implying, hey, you 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 kill demons, but even you don't kill people you love. 
When have you ever killed anyone you love? You're asking me to do something that even you don't do. So that was a little bit of a dig. <laughs> you, know, you know, Krishna was, I mean, Arjuna was upset, but he did not bow out of dialogue. Not only did he not bow out of dialogue, he saw it as the only way out of his irresolvable ethical dilemma that caused him so much pain and suffering and hopelessness. Dialogue is the answer. Dialogue is the answer. As soon as we refuse dialogue, we are severing ourselves from the greater reality and from other relationships. Oh. This actually brings us again to the, uh, I'm just bringing this, I, I love this point about how sometimes a neg I have experienced that somebody offers, say something very, uh, scathing, but then if somehow we are able to get get beyond that initial negativity or resentment, then we find that uh, sometimes some of some of our deepest relationships happen because there is candor in the relationship. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, what Krishna says that which tastes like poison in the beginning tastes like nectar in the end. Right. So if that if that is so that means. Uh, if we don't penetrate through that, there is a tendency to, if somebody criticizes us, to go on the defensive. And I think we discussed that elaborately in our earlier session. But uh, this point about dialogue uh, being the basis. So the refusal to dialogue, we can say that is, in one sense, if we it is likely to cause hurt, either to the receiver of criticism or even to the giver of criticism. Yes. And then well, really, if a person yeah. is giving criticism also, they also put in some thought. They also yeah. put in, like, you know, sometimes devotees ask me to review their writings and I offer some review and sometimes that devotee never gets back to me after the review. They don't speak <laughs> one word about it. You know, thank you or I felt bad about this. Right. I become worried. You know, what happened? Did I, did I hurt you about it? That's right. Hmm. That's right. Well, um, a, a few months ago, I wrote a leading devotee in the movement, a leading devotee in the movement who produces some books. And I questioned why does he do what he does? Is, is he not distracting devotees from doing this or that or that? You know, and I, I was rather pointed about like, please explain how we should understand what he is doing. I didn't hear from him. I resent it. I said, in case you didn't get this, um, I look forward to your response. I was very systematic in my letter. And then I sent a third letter, which said, uh, you know, hey, um, I don't know why I'm not getting a response from you. Um, perhaps you could let me know. Uh, but I am sincere in my inquiry, and others are as well. We want to know, blah, 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 and so on. And he still did not respond. Now, I don't know him very well. He doesn't know me very well. In fact, we hardly know each other at all, but we certainly know who each other is. Mm -hmm. And he is a leading very prominent devotee, which means that he has a responsibility to respond. That's interesting. How, and, how, how do you correlate that? If you're leading devotee, sometimes some you say that somebody might say that, you know, that, uh, you know, I get, uh, of course, you know, you are also a leading devotee in our movement. So in that sense, it's you are, you raising a concern is different from say some, you don't want to devalue any devotee, but somebody who just picks up a, a keyboard and writes something, there's a difference. So in some ways we say that if somebody is criticizing, one of the ways is just neglect it, it'll go away. Because sometimes it may happen that, you know, two people are so unlike-minded that the other person is not going to understand what we are doing. So 
when when you say that you have an obligation to respond, can you explain that? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I practice what I preach. I happened across a. I don't know if I said this in my last talk with you, but I I happened across a uh, a, a a thread Facebook thread. Yeah, I think we're devoted. That, yeah. Right, remember I, I mentioned this and they were criticizing me like anything. Now, these sound like very disgruntled devotees, very, you know, nothing good is an ISKCON, blah, blah, blah. And so they decided one day to pick on me. Did I, I could have just said, you know what, Chaitanya Charya, I'll just throw that out as like, these devotees are so troubled and so negative and they just want to tear everything down. I could have said that and just dismissed it, but I didn't. Why? Because, and even though these, none of these devotees were well known, if someone mentioned their names to anyone, they, no one would know who they were, right? Mm. I didn't care about that. I didn't care that they were nobody devotees, okay? Because to me, there are no nobody devotees. So if someone is criticizing me, I want to learn from them. Interestingly, of course, none, none of them wrote me back. So you see, they were never in, they were never intending constructive dialogue. When they had the opportunity to engage in constructive criticism in dialogue, they didn't take it up. Their intention clearly became known to me as simply wanting to hurt me. And that, Chaitanya Charanji, is what is the nature of envy. That is true. See, if I'm, you see, jealousy and envy are not the same. If I'm jealous of you, Chaitanya Charanji, because I like your shape of glasses better than mine. And then my wife goes out and I say, I want, I, you know, I'm jealous of Chaitanya Charanji. He's got a beautiful shape of glasses and mine are not so nice. She goes out, gets identical pair of glasses. Then my jealousy is gone. But if I'm envious of you, if I see you happy with your shape of glasses, and even if my wife gets me a hundred pairs just like yours, I'm still mm -hmm. not happy. Oh. I'm only happy when you lose your glasses. Oh, okay. So jealousy, you can say, is more centered on particular objects, whereas envy is directed toward persons. Yeah, but it's 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 more than that. It's it's jealousy is 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 um, I might be jealous of you for being. Uh, uh, let's say so um, okay. uh, learned learned in Bhagavad Gita, okay, whatever, okay. So if I become learned in, in Bhagavad Gita, then I'm no longer jealous of you. But oh, okay. if okay. if I if if I want you to to uh, be hurt, you know, uh, mm -hmm. over the head, you know, and then lose your great memory, this is evil. Oh. Chaitanya Charanji. Okay, that's a very categorical difference. Yeah. This is evil. Yeah, this is evil. If I if my intention is I want to say things about Chaitanya Charanji that will hurt him. No, that's you know, to, to do that is evil. To to say um I want to offer constructive criticism to this devotee because I see him actually hurting other devotees. And I want to make sure that one, he's aware of it, two, that maybe he could correct it and not hurt other devotees. And then you see everything gets, everything's elevated to a higher level. Yeah. So, so the idea is dialogue. It's all the locus of truly constructive criticism of true evolving and upliftment is dialogue. The, it's, it's only when uh, we become at odds with each other and we don't engage in dialogue and we simply uh, complain on the side and we uh, uh, convince others um, that in something that will hurt um, someone, 
uh, then that's 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 evil. If our intention is to hurt, so you know this is the hatimata offense, the hatimata aparada, the first aparada of the chanting of the holy names. To blaspheme means to make them less than who they are. If someone, if 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 uh, I see a devotee, um, uh, you know. Uh, you know, accidentally stepping on the toes of other devotees, just with his as he walks. Well, if if I simply call him, he's nothing but a toe stepper. You know, um, <laughs> I mean, it's a stupid example, but but the idea is that I I that one offense or that or uh, not offense that one um, not good thing that he does, I can I I see that as the whole person. That's a problem. Um, so again, this is a form of reductionism. I take a the weakest part of a person and take that as the whole person. That makes sense. That's reductionism. And then to go further to our topic, to give some interpretation on the holy name. There we go. Now there's the apparad of giving some interpretation. And here I am today, I could be looking like I'm giving some interpretation on the holy name. Okay, so the, what does that mean to give an interpretation? What this means is to take a universal mantra as the Maha Mantra and say that it means this as if it only means this. Um, this is a, I like this whole reductionism because I was recently asked this question that there are some there is a, some study done by the uh, Dr. David Brian Wolf about mantra chanting leading to helping people decrease their depression and uh, negative habits. So this question came up: Isn't that a mundane interpretation? So I corresponded with that devotee also. He said that you know. Uh, Apparently, Prabhupada in BTG was when BTG was being published. Prabhupada devotees talked about how chanting changes the brain states, like something similar to what psychedelic drugs do. And now I don't remember the exact specifics, but Prabhupada was not very, very approving of that kind of explanation at that time. Right. But I, it, we can say that chanting has. Say social dimensions, physical dimensions, neural dimensions, but to say that chant that is all that chanting is, that yeah. is where it will become a problem. That's right. So, just, yeah. just like when I have colleagues telling me that uh, the Gita is about um, uh, uh, offering the fruits of your activities, you know, or, or not being attached to the fruits of your acti activities, I've I've actually heard academic colleagues say that's what the whole Gita is about. And I say, you're kidding me. You're kidding. That's, that's you're kidding. Me. Yeah, I mean, no, come that's on. Mm -hmm. Maybe cha in chapters three, four, and five, maybe there's, but but it's even, but even those chapters to say much more than that. <laughs> so, I mean, you oh. know, I mean, so they've reduced the whole Gita. But then, but then one colleague of mine, came up to me after reading my translation of the Gita several times. He said, he said, Graham, I think I've got it. I think, I think I see what is being said in the Gita, that the Gita is ultimately, uh, the Gita is saying that the universe is ultimately a loving place. I said, wow. I said, that's pretty good. I like that. That's not bad. See, he's moving in the right direction that the universe mm. is ultimately a loving place. I thought that was a beautiful way of putting it. Beautiful, really, I like it. And yeah. it does seem also, uh, so it, it, is, it is also so non-sectarian in a way that is harmonious with the principles of bhakti. Mm. That's right. Yeah. The universe is ultimately a loving place. I mean, one could fill that out, you know, and go and go crazy with that statement. So it's, it's, it's a, 
by summer, one thing we learn in graduate studies is how to summarize things. And by the way, you do this beautifully um, in each of your presentations with your interviews, but how to summarize things without uh, reducing them. Mm. That's hard, that's hard. How to summarize things without dummying it down. Again, another form of reductionism. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this universe is a loving place. We as devotees might also reduce the Gita. This world is a place of misery. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Well, yeah. yeah, the Gita says that that this uh, this world is a place of misery. But you know, but the Gita doesn't just focus on this world. Yeah, and also in a sense gives us a way to live in this world, so that we cannot, we need not be that miserable. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, Arjuna is crying at the start of the Gita. And Krishna doesn't say, Arjuna, you are crying now. You realize this world is miserable. No need for me to speak yeah. anything more. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You've reached perfection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your state of hopelessness is exactly where you should be. You're hopeless. Good. Stay there. Yeah. That's not what happened. Mm -hmm. That is not what happened. Not at all. And when dialogue, I mean, the whole Gita is a dialogue. Mm -hmm. And and when and when um uh, this dharmyam samvadam, this sacred dialogue, is, is that phrase is used. Dharmyam samvadam is used by Sanjaya. Sanjaya. At the end, Sanjaya is in a fit of ecstasy when he thinks about this dialogue. So dialogue also has the effect of uplifting others, even when you're not a part of the dialogue. Yeah, beautiful, yes. Like when, you, when you refuse dialogue, it also not only hurts you, hurts the other person, but guess what? It hurts others too. Mm. It hurts others who are connected to you and connected to them or connected to the other person. Yes, so going back to your earlier point about obligation to respond, you know, maybe it also depends on if the other person is just not ready to see reason, then stopping the dialogue is, or not engaging in dialogue any further is fine. But if the other person is actually genuinely with concern and some level of openness inquiry, then one is, uh, it's a part of the Vaishnava Bhakti process to say, Dadati Pratigrahmi, Puchyati, we can say. So... Because sometimes it is said that what is that saying that the uh, the dogs will bark but the caravan rolls on. Yeah. And Prabhupada would talk about that with respect to some criticism that he would get at times. But right. also Prabhupada would respond. You know, when when people said that there's some critical articles about devotees in Indian newspapers, Prabhupada had Giriraj Bhaj and others write responses, and Prabhupada himself went over those responses and he edited. So so it's not a one zero thing. Not that right. we we should never respond, or not that we are always obliged to respond, but uh, it is a uh, because sometimes some people, especially when uh, when somebody get, gets to a leadership position, sometimes there's just so much uh, coming up that uh, so many people may say so many things that it's difficult to respond to all of them. So yeah. I think it, a lot depends on the context or the tone or the candidate. We could say. Yeah, I mean, some of the criticism, criticisms uh, may not be genuinely true, constructive criticisms, where, whereas other uh, uh, criticisms uh, can be, um, uh, you know, a kind of clothed expression of, of one's own hurt and dissatisfaction and state of misery. So, uh, you know, when I'm hurt, and I, I, I may start lashing out and hurting others. And that could come in the form of excessive, you know, and harsh, you know, um, uh, uh, and name calling and this and that and the other. I mean, this, this can go on. Um, uh, again, true con truly constructive criticism is so terribly valuable. It really is. Um, and, and yet there can be those who run from it. 
Now you say, maybe they're not ready for it. So yeah, there's a, one has to gauge receptivity. When I wrote this leading devotee, now see, my point is, don't be a leading devotee if you can't answer these questions. You know, my, you know, these are reasonable questions um, that many devotees have been asking, but they haven't had enough. You know, I, I'm someone who doesn't, maybe I need to have a little more fear in me, but uh, I just don't have any fear. When something's worthwhile to ask, I ask it. I have no fear. When something has to be challenged, I challenge it. I have no fear, especially when it will help and protect other devotees. I don't care so much about myself. I can handle things. I'm fine. I have my little bubble. I'm in my little world. But when I see other devotees hurt and confused, I have to come to their aid. I just cannot not come to their aid. So when a leading devotee is simply unwilling to engage in dialogue when he or she is doing things in their sevas that affect a lot of devotees, but are puzzling and perplexing them, many of them, then I, then I speak up. Mm. In one sense, you know, your position, you are you are a, you are very much a part of say Prabhupada's movement. At the same time, you have a position and an identity which is not dependent on the movement. So that also helps you to, to you could say, be a voice of challenge when necessary. Of course, yes. apart from that, I would say it's your, your also your your nature and your intellectual caliber also plays a role. Yeah, and I want one other thing is that you are not going and putting this on social media. You're actually giving that devotee an opportunity to respond. But on the other hand, many people they don't deal with, they don't talk that particular with that particular devotee. Rather, they just put everything on social media, and right? you know this person is like this and that person is like that. And then there is, it is, we could say it is the opposite of engaging in dialogue. It is, it is, it's almost like a monologue or a rant, which is done in public. Right. Yeah, that is, that is actually, that is the most destructive because people right. get confused. That's right. That's right. And, and, and if there is a discussion online in some kind of format, a blog or Facebook or whatever, um, at least it should be conducted. Uh, and and if, there, if a party does not respond, but yet uh, uh, other parties who are being hurt and perplexed by someone's behavior or someone's activities, then at least it should be done in the most gentlemanly manner. And one should avoid reductionistic statements. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, you can be reductionistic even, even with... Um, not intending to. I mean, even when you're talking very positively about someone, um, uh, you know, um, he he is a he is a you know he is a pure devotee. You know, if someone comes along and say, and and to ask me, so what do you think about Chaitanya Charan? I said, oh, Chaitanya Charan, he's a pure devotee. My God! So here we are reducing the idea of pure devotion. Then, you know, we're reducing well, the person. Well, but first of all, I don't. Who am, first of all, who am I to okay. declare Chaitanya Charan as a pure devotee? Okay, so, yeah. so I'm reducing the, the vision of pure devotion to what I can perceive. Beautiful. Now, what, now, what I can say, and no one can argue with this, when I interact with Chaitanya Charan, I feel a lot of purity of intention and understanding and he's a perfect delight with whom to engage in dialogue. Now, no one, no one can argue with me on that because that's my experience. Now, if I, will, if I say that everyone will, will find Chaitanya Charanji a perfect you know, uh, interlocutor, you know, a perfect person in which to engage in dialogue, well, that's not true. Hmm. 
Not everyone's going to like you the way I like you. Again, reductionism. Even though it's a positive statement. How is it a reductionism? Reductionism of what here? So I'm reducing... It is a distortion, but I, I mean, it is not an accurate representation of reality, but uh, uh, is it a reduction? So if you consider like, say a person is multidimensional, you are seeing, uh, you, are, say you are seeing me from a particular perspective or I am seeing you from a particular perspective. Right. And say I am reducing the person to whom I am speaking that your experience should also be like this. Is that where the reductionism is coming? That if you say- I'm, redu I I'm reducing the reality of the situation oh, to something okay. according okay. that that matches my, in other words, I'm playing God. That's awful. So I'm saying the way it is for everybody, but that's just not true. That's amazing. You know, I, I just, we are maybe going a little off track, but I think it's a very, <laughs> Explore it very important exploratory discussion. But yeah. see, in general, uh, like I remember one of my early formative experiences was there was some controversial issue. And uh, there's a this senior devotee who was asked this question. So, Maharaj, what, what is what are your thoughts about this? So he said, you know, this is this is not the question you should be asking. I am just a tiny jiva who cares what my thoughts are. So the question you should be asking is, what is the Shastra Vichar on this, uh, this particular issue? What do scriptures say on this issue? And at that time, everybody had applauded. But then later on, I thought about it. Okay, you know, Shastra can say many things on this issue. It's ultimately, <laughs> it's ultimately you are giving your take on the issue. So there is almost like a devaluation of individual opinion. If I am saying this is how I have experienced this or this is how I have seen it, sometimes within the movement, there is a, uh, there is a, it's considered to be too self-centered, you know, that how you experienced it. It's almost like we want to make sure that I am speaking the absolute truth and I'm not speaking my opinion, which is, which is okay. We don't want to just give our speculative opinions. Yeah. But I think there's a difference between a uh, speculative opinion and uh, and a subjective realization or subjective appreciation. And yeah. okay. we are almost afraid of that. So now you 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 I like you flip the script that instead of saying that uh, something when I am expressing my understanding of the situation, it's not that I am putting I in the center. It's not a sign of arrogance. It actually is a sign of humility. And if I don't bring the I into the picture, then I am actually playing God. And this is how it is. So not right. bringing the I can actually be a sign of arrogance. Of course, That's everything right. depends on context. If it's too I-centered, then it's a problem also. But uh, it's, we, we needn't be afraid of bringing the subjective into our discussion of, the, of reality and even philosophy. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes. But, but actually, I, I like what you're saying. That ironically, by trying to erase the I, you might be more subjected to the false sense of I than you would have if you had been genuinely just being an I. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, you know, so, you know, here's the thing that devotee with perhaps all the best of intentions by saying, don't ask me what I think. Let's just go to Shastra and see what it says. That assumes, that statement that he made by saying he goes to Shastra to see what it says, that assumes that he knows all Shastra. And mm -hmm. that's reductionism. So he's going to go, so, so, oh, what does, so what does Prabhupada say? Uh, Prabhupada says there's no love in the material world. So there you have it. Wait a minute. Wait, Prabhupada says other things about love. Oh, oh, well, um, okay. Okay, see, now we're raising it from a Tamasaguna interpretation or understanding of Shastra or Prabhupada's statement to like 
maybe more of a madhyama, you know, or, or a madhyama understanding instead of kanishta, more of a, a rajasa uh, interpretation rather than a, a tamasa interpretation. So, oh, well, there are these other statements. Oh, so maybe going to Shastra is not just that simple. Again, reductionism. And then the Uttama vision, the Sattvika vision of Shastra is to gain, is to have in one's possession an extraordinarily powerful understanding of the whole that does not reduce, but can shed some beautiful light on this statement, as well as that statement, as well as the other relevant statement. So it's not, see, it's not just about going to Shastra. It's about what level of understanding are you you having in relation to Shastra, which says a lot about what kind of adhikar you have. Adhikar is about devotional development. Can you even see what this says? Beautiful. So... This idea of the subjective, it the word subjective may it has a somewhat of a lack of authority to it. But I think right. the word adhikar is very clearly within the tradition. And we all now we may we may classify adhikar into simply three levels as Kanishta, Madhyam, and Uttama. And that is valid, but adhikar is in one sense subjective. And even at the Kani Madhyama level, there can be different levels. Uh, there can be different understandings. You know, Uttama level also, there can be different understandings. That's right. So, so the word Adhikar, Adhikar is, I think, very shastrically grounding the idea of uh, sub, uh, of maybe not subjective, of individual appreciation of scripture. Or as Prabhupada said, they examine things from different perspectives. So Adhikar, okay. our Adhikar determines our perspective, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so Guru Sadhu, Shastra. So let us see what Shastra says. This devotee says to you. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what about Guru? How, How much Guru are you? My dear devotee, sir, in other words, to this devotee that that, uh, is speaking to you. Let's go to Shastra. Well, no one just goes to Shastra. It's a question of what you bring to Shastra. And, and guru means heavy. So if we are teachers and we are teaching what is in Shastra, you had better be uh, gravely uh, uh, grounded in Shastra as much as you can be to be able to speak Shastra to uh, perfectly sadhu uh, so in other words there are various ways to understand these epistemological correctives mm. you know you, you don't we don't just separate shastra from guru and sadhu so i uh, know I, I love the statement of yours that no one just goes to shastra we have we, what we have to consider what we bring to shastra Yes. And so recently I had a, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a podcast with Yogeshwar Prabhu on some of Prabhupada's difficult statements. He had written an article on Prabhupada's statements about Jews. And he brought this in that if certain statements somebody highlights or if certain statements of Prabhupada trouble us, then it actually speaks more about us than it speaks about Prabhupada. Why do we consider these statements so problematic? Or why do we consider this statement so important that we have to we have to fight to establish their authority? So both ways. So now I'm just trying to place this you use also epistemological correctives within Guru Sadhu Shastra. What we bring to Shastra that will be are you placing that in ourselves as that we if we are teaching then we are taking the role of a guru. So where does this come in Guru Sadhu Shastra? What we bring to Shastra or is it something else? That's right. That's right. So, so you know, when 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 he was being um, again as well intentioned, 
as he easily might have been. Yeah. You know, I'm not important. Let's see what Shastra says. Well, that's just not a fact. Mm. Yeah, we can also say that there are so many gurus in our movement, so many teachers, and they all are studying and teaching the same Shastra, but they have their own way of teaching. They have their own way of... Uh, Absolutely. Teaching. So where is Absolutely. that coming from? That is not coming from Shastra. That That's is right. coming from their individuality. That's what and... they bring. That's what they bring. It's the way they, what they take from Shastra. It's what they bring to Shastra. It's a dialogue or a lack of. Lack of means um, it, it's 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 the, it, it, an increasing dialogue or or lacking a, a, a lacking of dialogue. Um, oh, okay. What, what we bring and what we take. That's true. So true. I mean, if somebody has uh, if somebody has studied Sanskrit before and they come and study Shastra, then they they will teach much more based on uh, Sanskrit, uh, quoting a lot of Sanskrit verses and explaining things. Somebody has come from a very analytical kind of background, then they will also analyze scripture elaborately. Yeah. So what we bring to scripture determines what we take from scripture. That's amazing. Yes, but even, even, even with knowing Sanskrit, that doesn't mean, and people confuse this, because you know Sanskrit doesn't mean that you have more authority on what Shastra is saying. Yes, that's so true. Actually, this is, this is such a simple point, but sometimes because Sanskrit is seen as a sacred language, it's misunderstood. Yes. Just because, say, if I know, if I'm good at English, doesn't mean I have a I'm an authority in quantum physics. It's just because right. the book on quantum physics is written in Sanskrit, is in English and English. Right. So there are exactly, and that's a, that's a, that's just I mean say. With respect to spiritual subject, that's also oversimplification of right. the reality, which is so much more. Mm. So, in a sense, Prabhu, I just we have focused our discussion more on the topic of reductionism, <laughs> and have, yeah. and I think it's it's also a very important topic which uh, organically emerged and it's a very valuable discussion. So, the, I, I'm for the time that we have, can we just go in this direction? So, trying to come back to the holy name. Maybe we can yes. have the discussion on the holy name a little later. The two, three yes. points I wanted to ask or to discuss uh, with respect to reductionism. Mm. Is that okay? Yes, perfectly fine. Perfectly so, fine. Uh, so, the, fa the fact is, Chaitanya Charanji, yeah. when you and I engage in dialogue, there is absolutely no predicting what direction it will go in. <laughs> it it takes on a life of its own. Yeah, that's so true. I fully agree yeah. with you on this. Yeah. When I get on with you, I am like having, I'm totally, you know, I, I just have no idea where, where we're going to go. You know, it's like getting in a car together and like, who knows where we'll end up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but wherever it is that we end up, it's always good. Yes, that's no doubt about that. It's, we it's always end up enriched. I think our yeah, audience yeah. also will end up enriched. So, we hope so. Yes, true. <clears throat> so at one level, we are all finite beings. So for finite yeah. beings, isn't reductionism in one sense inescapable? Or what is escapable is the admission of our reductionism. So <laughs> right. because we can't avoid our finiteness, we will never become infinite. So right. is it that just by acknowledging that that this is my perspective, that's the way we deal with reductionism. And then maybe we consult others who see things from other perspectives. And then also, hey, that also makes sense. So how do we actually avoid reductionism? Because isn't that in one sense, uh, entailment of our finite condition? Yes, beautifully put. Uh, your, your, your question also makes a, a declaration, which is very true. We are very small. And reality is beyond anything we can possibly comprehend. So when these infinitesimal jivas come together, the way to overcome reductionism is to engage in dialogue, true dialogue. Dialogue is the antidote to reductionism. It's the antidote. It's, 
it, because you see, Chaitanya Charan is has a perception of one part of reality. He has his own experiences. He comes from a certain place. He's got certain conditionings, so on and so forth. And he has a transcendental experience of bhakti. He has, he has transcendental experiences. So all of that can be so valuable to me who has his own conditionings and has his own perspectives and has his own experiences in bhakti. So we come together and we see what we can learn from one another. Oh, okay. That's beautiful. So, I mean, I mean for, a, for example, Chaitanya Charan might say, Garuda, you're being reductionistic by saying that, you, that we're being reductionistic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay, so I mean, you could very well challenge me, say, Garuda. You know, by claiming this whole thing about reductionism, by saying that all the ten uh, aparads to the holy name is is different forms of reductionism, which I still believe it is. You know, you're being reductionistic about the aparads, about being reductionistic. So you know, what, what, you know, you could argue that, you know, and then we would have a discussion. Is Garuda being so? That would be a criticism. Is Garuda being reductionistic in claiming that the ten aparads are different forms of reductionism? Beautiful. Okay. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, mm, so dialogue is critical, and that's the antidote. We, it's the antidote. Antidote. Okay. You know, this is in the Gita. Uh, one of my, we could say, one of my favorite realizations. Maybe okay, not favorite, but. I'll, how Krishna in the Chatur Shloki, first he says that Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo, those people are Buddha, they are enlightened. And right, yet right. in the next verse he says, they discuss and they enlighten each other. Bodhayanta Parasparam. So if they are enlightened, Buddha, how are they doing Bodhayanta? So one way of understanding it is, could be that they are enlightened in the sense that they know Krishna is the ultimate reality. But how wonderful Krishna is, how he's perceived from different perspectives, that they can that we can always keep enlightening ourselves. So we see that even in the perfectional stage, also there is dialogue, and that, that dialogue is considered to be the highest, uh, highest relishable activity. Mm. It gives what uh, uh, teacher you know, the great, great joy in that. So yes, we can sir. say dial, dialogue is for. Both understanding at say at the level of seekers, and it can be also for relishing. So I, I don't want to say that it's only for understanding at the level of seekers and relishing at the level of seers, but understanding and relishing both happen at all levels. And nobody yes. can say that now I am enlightened, I don't need dialogue. In fact, if you are no. enlightened, we will look forward to dialogue all the more. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, ultimately, one's dialogue is with the uh, divine personages in the holy uh, Raja, Raja Dham. We're always engaged in dialogue. Bhakti means dialogue. Bhakti means sharing. And the Chatur Shloki about uh, you know, the, 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 the shlokas, the, the four verses that you point to in the Gita, they are all about our epistemology, which is an epistemology of the heart. Buddha bhava samanvitaha, you know, Buddha bhava. Okay, it, it's it's the intelligence is within the bhava. So so you know, iti matwa bajante mam. When you love me, when you love me, then you will find within the heart the way to know me. And then, and then, of course, what is the next one? Machita, machita prana. Machita. Give your chitta, your heart, to me. Once having given your heart to me, even, even your very life breath, madgata prana, to me, the life breath that, that even allows you to be sustained, then bodhayanta prana. And that's a causative. Then I can cause you to be enlightened, and you can cause me to be enlightened. Why? Parasparam, one another. And then what happens? You and I can talk endlessly. Katiyantas jamanityam. 
will never stop. And that's you, Chaitanya Charan. You never stop. You're talking to everyone in every way and all the time. So you're you're all about dialogue. You know, that's you. That's what you're about. And and then and then what happens? Whoa. Tushanti cha ramanti cha. I'm not only completely satisfied, but I'm in ecstasy. Ramanti cha. Great pleasure is derived from this. Oh, so patience, satisfaction, ramanti, ecstasy. Oh, yeah. Uh, so beautiful. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah. pleasure. Like Great, ecstatic great. pleasure. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yes, so this is the uh, epistemology of love. You said epistemology of the heart. That of the heart. And yeah. then the next verse it does the same thing. Tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti puravakam. Bhajatam priti puravakam. Look, when you love me, you get to know everything. Premanjana Trinity Bhakti Velochanena Santa Sadai Bhridayeshu Velokayanti. Hridayeshu Velokayanti. Seeing within the heart, what happens? Achintya Guna Swarupam. Things you things that are inconceivable, you can now know. Yeah. Chaitanya Charanji, this is the essence. This is the essence. So in that state, there is no reductionism because in love, you take in the whole. Take in the whole. You Can embrace you the whole. So there is no reductionism. In love, Dialogue is a loving act, by the way. That, that's a, that's a, yeah. it's, at least it's an act that's open to love. And ultimately, when one attains, you know, shravanam kirtanam, it, and we, we trade off shravanam kirtanam. You know, sometimes you speak, sometimes I speak, sometimes I listen, sometimes you listen. Shravanam kirtanam, shravanam kirtanam, shravanam kirtanam, whatever. Mm. But then Chaitanya Charan and Garuda find themselves Vishnu Smarga. We're both lifted up into the being of Vishnu. Actually, this is our process. This is our process. Yeah. It's anti-reductionistic. What is anti-reductionistic? Love. Yeah, actually, in a, in a practical sense, also, if we really love someone, we love the whole person. We can't say we may like some aspects, we may not like so much aspects, but we love the whole person. Yeah. We, Which means that you're open to anything in that person that you don't even know and the things that you do know. Yeah, okay. There's liking and disliking, there's also knowing and unknowing. No, knowing and that's not right. knowing also, yeah. That's right. And uh, that's what actually makes a relationship also a discovery then. Exactly. Because sometimes uh, people feel, people say that, you know, Oh, you are different now. You are different in the past. You have become different. So I don't love you anymore. But the, now it is like the difference is going to happen in any relationship. And then we go along with the ride and we try to explore. We can't yes. ex expect even, that. Even, even Krishna wants to understand the mystery of Radha's love for him. Even that baffles him. And so he has to come as Chaitanya. Mm -hmm. And then we take shelter of Chaitanya Chara. You know, you can say, we take shelter of Garuda to fly high into the sky toward the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> see, all the names work, you know, all the names. See, we're very, we're very fortunate to have beautiful names, you know. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. So we just one more point about this, about reductionism, if you don't mind, then we'll yeah, to, please. I don't want yeah. to take you uh, too much of your time. How much time do you have, Prabhu? Mm. Um, well, give it some more, a few minutes, as, as yeah, sure. we can naturally yeah, we'll wind naturally down end as, end you end. Fit, yeah. as you see fit. Okay. okay, sure. So, see, it's also, uh, di now dialogue is important. At the same time, I'm not sure whether dialogue is possible with everyone. Even if everybody is a devotee, there is also that uh, saying that uh, 
Sajati Ashaya Bhagavad Bhakti Sangha, you know, like minded devotee association. Yes. So it is. And to some extent, I have found that very important. Because even in bhakti, although we may agree that Krishna is the ultimate value, along the journey to Krishna, we all may value different things. Yes. Like somebody whose who's defining value is, say, building temples or distributing books, they may think that what we are doing is basically a waste of time. Why don't you do some service? And it's not that they are wrong. They are valuing things differently. Yes, so. Sure. They are valuing the value of Krishna, but they are valuing Krishna differently. So yes. I mean, this question has two parts. One part is that it is at one level, dialogue also needs to be done with like-minded devotees so that it becomes relishable. Otherwise, yes. it just becomes too incompatible. But right. at the same time, uh, this is happening more and more in our po politically polarized world in America, especially even in India, that people start living in their own echo chambers where yes. we only hear things that reinforce our worldview. That's right. So then we just start in that. And the end result of that is we start demonizing others. But if That's someone right. doesn't agree with me, they, just, they, just, they are either stupid or they are evil. That's right. So, so on that's, one what side, I that's what I think. That's what I think. Either you agree with me, Chaitanya Charanji, or you're just dumb and evil. <laughs> that's my attitude that's my attitude but you know but you know what Chaitanya Charanji mm -hmm. dialogue let's say we are dialoguing about some difficult issues mm -hmm. and you just say you know what Garuda I don't want to talk anymore but I said Chaitanya Charan please let's continue these are hard subjects let's continue let's go through this together and you refuse. Now, someone else will say, well, Chaitanya Charan broke the dialogue. Garuda was not clever enough or knowledgeable enough or attractive enough to Chaitanya Charan to get him to stay in the dialogue. So here I am without Chaitanya Charan we have now fallen out of dialogue, both of us. Mm. What can Garuda do who insists on the value of dialogue? He claims that dialogue is the antidote to reductionism. I don't want to reduce Chaitanya Charan's viewpoint on something to mere, you know, uh, merely something that he doesn't even agree with uh, and so on. So what, what does Garuda do? What can Garuda do? He can either feel despondent and like disappointed and and uh, even maybe a little offended that he would that Chaitanya Charan would leave the dialogue, or Garuda has a choice to still stay in dialogue. So dialogue means to keep the door open whenever the person wants to come back, or what do you mean? Openness is always good. But dialogue should continue. Dialogue between the self and the supreme self. The same supreme self that is in me is in you. I can continue this dialogue with you unwittingly. Really? Yes. Beautiful. In fact, this is how we can stay in dialogue with those persons who have departed this world. Yes. Tamal Krishna Goswami departed this world 20 years ago, a day or so ago. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. He and I became very close friends. Oh, I know he's controversial. He has controversial pasts in, in so many different ways. But I still dialogue with him. Really? The dialogue does not have to end. So when you say dialogue, is it that you ponder his memories or ponder his, some of his statements or how does it, in principle, it's fine to understand that the superfood is present 
with in same super soul is where my heart and their heart but how does it actually is it more like a presence that is experienced or what do we mean by that exit or is it not okay. ethical okay so we can parallel it a little bit with like um the internet so i'm speaking to you through the internet hmm. now when you get off you know the internet stops connecting both of us because you've you know you've gotten off on offline well krishna is like the divine internet that never goes off it's impossible to turn off the internet of the heart so beautiful yeah okay so i can offer thoughts and feelings to tamal krishna goswami or you know i could even do this with my father my mother who have departed um whomever right dear devotee friends who have left this world bhakti charu swami who whom i dearly loved i wrote the uh i wrote the preface to his book yeah i read that that's beautiful yeah and advised his him on it, writing his book he even wanted me to edit his book but i had to refuse that but i gave him other options and um and, and radhana swami wrote the the uh, forward after my preface i wrote the preface he wrote the the the, the forward and you know we have a connection there's no reason why that connection has to be severed by mere physicality it's only through love that the internet of krishna really can work beautiful so we are going beyond here in the technological power or even mystical power it's more of a devotional yeah. power mm -hmm. it's, it's it's krishna krishna is in your heart in the same way he's in my heart mm -hmm. and there is a presence that we can perceive through krishna so it's you know it, it when prabhupada speaks about the tree you know you water the roots of the tree and the tree you know the rest of the tree grows well in a way that's kind of like a botanical analog to the internet <laughs> okay <laughs> botanical okay it's striking Hmm. I think every time we talk Chaitanya Charanji I throw hmm. things at you that that shock you a little bit every once in a while right shock in a very pleasant way <laughs> definitely <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know it's uh, you could say the conceptions of bhakti keep expanding hmm. yeah in one sense uh, I feel the expansion happens in many different ways one is something we come to know that which we don't know another is we come to know in a newer way that which we thought we knew yeah. so both are relishable but the second is in, the, in fact it has a greater element of surprise and joy yeah like some some aspect of some things which we knew we hey we realized we did, i need to really know think of it this way yeah so 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 if the if, uh, let me just rephrase the answer to your question the, the way you answered my question You yeah. said that even if somebody, we should always try to have dialogue, even with people who are say unlike-minded. And if somebody leaves the dialogue, then also we can continue it within the heart. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, for that continuation of the dialogue, a certain level of uh, say affection is required. Otherwise, it's very difficult to actually connect with the person, even in their presence, or to speak of their absence. So. Right. in some ways uh, maybe this will this can be a subject for a future podcast if it's going to take a long time but there are two things in one sense because the world is so big our movement is so big 
So at one level, we can say, live and let live. This is the way I practice bhakti. And this is the way you practice bhakti. Yeah. So you don't criticize me and I don't criticize you. So yeah. that is, we could say, an approach of tolerance, inclusion. Prabhupada built a house big enough in which uh, everyone can live. So that's one way. So even, even to come to live and let live, there has to be some level of mutual understanding. Uh, mm-hmm. That, you know, okay, I don't necessarily, I won't do what you're doing. I may not necessarily agree with what you're doing, but that's what you're doing. That's fine. But that's different from, say, two, like two people living in hermetically sealed chambers where they just don't understand or appreciate anything at all. So, so when that, so you could say that dialogue can be between like people who come very close to each other because of their nature or because of their service, because of their values. Or sometimes dialogue can be just to arrive at a more informed level of understanding between each other. So, yes. so do we also need to be uh, selective about with whom we have what kind of dialogues? Yes. So it's not it's not reductionism to say that you know with this person. No, no it's not. Uh, I it's can't really get along. Yeah. Yeah. It's being discerning. It's being discerning. Some okay. people are not very, very receptive. You know, when I, when I, when I uh, teach uh, 40 undergraduates in a classroom, I have different levels of receptivity and lack of receptivity. Mm. Those youngsters are projecting onto me, you know, problems with authority figures, you know, daddy issues, you know, um, who knows what stuff, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, an old man with a beard and, and, and you know, and, and just coming in and who knows what they're projecting onto me. Right. So my task as a teacher, as a professor is to raise them above those conditioned, you know, receptivity filters to raise them above that. And the way to do that is to connect with them lovingly. Mm. Love is the only thing that can take us beyond our conditionings. It doesn't dissolve our conditionings, but it can free us from our conditionings and we can fly high. Beautiful. Now, now, but getting back to your point, so if I want to talk to you about, uh, let's say, karma, and you find that, no, I, you know, I'm really not into that discussion. You know, I don't, I'm not, I find it troubling, you know, whatever. Well, then you see the dialogue has already begun. Oh, well, Chaitanya Charanji, I didn't know that. Would, would you be willing to tell me what you find so originally I intended to talk to you about karma, but now the dialogue, because of my sensitivity to you, I'm trying to understand why is that a topic that you don't want to talk about. Now the dialogue's begun. Well, okay, but then you say, um, actually, I don't want to tell you what why it's troubling to me. Okay. Well, why not? Now the dialogue is still going. <laughs> so I won't let go. Well, why, what is, what is it about me? Perhaps you don't feel comfortable with me. And do you, so, well, I'm afraid that you'll, you'll tell other people what I think about karma and why the topic makes me nervous. And I, and I said, well, Okay, so here we have confidential deal. These are two exchanges between devotees. Chaitanya Charan, I promise you, I will keep this just between you and me. Now, I've I've pledged confidentiality. I'm, I'm making a sacrifice here. So you 
can feel freer to share with me. Now, you know, if I get offended on the way, you know, let's say before we get to this point, we've gone about four different levels, right? Let's say at the second level, I don't feel comfortable talking to you about it, Garuda. Oh, well then Chaitanya Charan, you know, well then I don't feel like talking to you either. <laughs> you know, and I start getting, well, okay. You know, then I get indignant, right? You see, ahankara, ahankara, ego-centeredness will, you'll suddenly your comment that you don't trust me. Suddenly I get offended. I said, well, you know what? I don't feel like talking to you either. Okay, goodbye, goodbye. Okay, so that there's no dialogue there. Okay, mm -hmm. but you see the whole point of bhakti is to go from ahankara to anyakara. Anyakara. What to be that? centered on another. Oh, beautiful. That's my yeah. own made, I, I made that up, but. Yeah, yeah. I thought, I think last time you had made another word. Was yeah. Transpersonal, no, trans. Yeah, trans embodiment. Trans embodiment, yeah. <laughs> yeah right, yeah. Hmm. Look, you get a PhD, you can make up your own words too. Okay, Chaitanya Jaranji? I mean, look, you know, <laughs> this is what I do. So, so it's a license, you know, PhD is it's like a special license, uh, you know, like diplomatic license or something like that, you know. Mm. Um, so, um, yes, Anyakara, I am not centered upon myself here. If I am, I get offended and say, Chaitanya Charan, don't bother calling me. Mm. No, no. I go further. I keep centered on you. I keep centering myself on you, not myself. Well, Chaitanya Charan, let's talk about this confidentially. Mm. See, I'm not, again, a subtle form of reductionism. Oh, you're offended? Well, so am I. So you see, I suddenly I'm reducing you to simply a, you know, uh, uh, an ego concerned person and um, there's nothing there to offer to me. So I've reduced you to that and that's good. And then, you know what, if that's all that I see, well, well, heck, you know, I, I, don't, I don't need to talk to Chaitanya Charan. But in order to not be reductionistic, let me, there's a good reason why Chaitanya Charan is troubled by the topic of karma. There's a good reason why he's not comfortable talking about it. There's a good reason why he doesn't want to talk to Garuda about it. There's a good reason why he might consider talking to Garuda about it if he promises confidentiality. So you bring it around. I try to serve Chaitanya Charan, not my ego. Anyakara, as opposed to ahankara. I love that anyakara, I love that word. So in a sense, if, uh, if say, the dialogue, it can begin, begin from an issue. And if it is going to be centered only on the issue, the person says, I don't want to talk about it, it's over. But if we see the issue, as a, maybe the issue is the right, the word issues has a negative, people have issues, we use our topic say. We see right. the topic as a launching pad for developing a deeper connection. Yeah. Then, okay, you don't want to talk about the topic, then I want to, it's not that I just want to discuss the topic, I want to understand you. So then we can always continue the discussion. So it also depends on what the thrust of the dialogue is. Is it the, is it the topic or is it the personal bond? And in one sense, in bhakti, the interpersonal connection and the interpersonal reciprocation is actually more important than a topic also. Yes. So yeah, Exactly. Beautiful. Yeah, I love the way you can explore this. Yes, so, no, it's, it's fantastic. And of course, anyakara can ultimately bring us into greater appreciation and uh, development of paramanyakara, the supreme other. Centered upon upon the supreme other. Beautiful. 
especially if we are uh, if both both at least share some devotional values then then definitely there is uh, they have also experienced krishna they are also serving krishna and it's worth yeah. us, it's worthwhile for us to learn how they are serving so yes. it's beautiful and one last question the yes. dialogue seems to be more among equals or at least there is some assumption that there is give and take yes whereas it may not necessarily be among equals but some assumption of like that is there but in scripture most of the conversations we see are between say an authority figure and a student if we consider the bhagavad gita we consider the bhagavatam maybe some of the upanishads there are a few a few more of we could say dialogues and yes. then they, they often go into debates also not exactly dialogues so right. this whole idea of bodhayantah parasparam or guhyam akhyati pruchyati right is it is it that uh, i mean that we don't see so much in scripture itself directly is it that that is scripture is meant to guide us to that and that's why scripture doesn't demonstrate that so much itself uh that by learning scripture we will be able to do this so that uh, now i don't know whether we could call say shukdev or swami and parishit maharaj as a dialogue we can but then it's parishit maharaj speaking maybe 5% shukdev goswami is speaking 95% So same in Gita, same in Gita, in the Gita also. So any but, part, so? but the Chaitanya Charitamrita is filled with dialogue. Look at Raman and Roy, and 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 Mahaprabhu Goranga. He's the, the, there's a whole catechism, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, what about now? Okay, but it, you know it's interesting. Mahaprabhu's dialogues take different shapes, just like you were implying earlier, Chaitanya Charanji. Um. was sarva bomo but the charya he said listen for 7 days okay talk okay. about some supreme shravanam wow and you know again going to reductionistic statement mayavadi bhashya kaile hole sasarvanash the chetan babu is hearing for 7 days from a person who has mayavadi background at that time that's right so there you go mm. so but then but then of course um uh with prakashananda saraswati he engages a dialogue in the foot uh, the the shoe room you know the the foyer of the temple and part of his dialogue was to shine so brightly oh. uh, and to to um it was remember what mahaprabhu says it, many sages disagree on points of philosophy but mm. it is the behavior of a vaishnava which establishes religion right um, uh, shadur shadur vyavahara right um uh, dharma stapane hetu shadur vyavahara i think yeah. is the yeah, is the right. phrase right yes so you know that's what we're all about so it's like you said it's not just the content but it's the form that the dialogue takes that is so important and what you were talking about are not equals as you corrected but balance balance according to what's appropriate for the individuals involved oh i mean balance is beautiful so in that balance. particular situation arjuna actually pours out his heart and the so for him to get the solution it is krishna has to speak much more <laughs> that's for, right exactly so, so just because we can't uh, judge whether something is a dialogue simply based on the percentage of who speaks how much it no, is no, no. how much the need is addressed exactly so, yeah and then there can be also yeah right in a dialogue well, called can... a dharmyam sambadam a sacred mm. dialogue it's just, it's it's called that and it is that uh, arjuna asks about 13 questions yes right and in the beginning he pours out his heart and krishna hardly says anything two or three words in the first chapter Beautiful. that's it yeah it's pours out his heart right mm-hmm. yeah almost uh, be, becomes his teacher no what is a teacher a teacher is supposed to teach so there's teaching dialogue 
Hmm. So that's interesting teaching dialogue. That's interesting, yeah. you know. So yeah, yeah. In fact, you 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 t- the best lecturers are those that lecture in a kind of tacitly dialogical fashion, oh. speaking to those. Uh, in whom one can perceive their reception and those to whom one can exercise great sensitivity while lecturing. Beautiful. Those, those are the best lectures. Yeah, and, and that is sometimes which becomes a little difficult when we are giving talks on Zoom and you can't really see the audience so well. But it's true. Yes. yes. And in fact, even now, for the last two minutes or so, your picture has been frozen on my screen. Oh, that's interesting. Now I notice that my picture is frozen on my screen. Also. Oh, your, your, uh, your picture of me is frozen? No, picture, my picture of me is frozen on my screen. That is strange. Yeah. Yeah. You have been frozen into a particular form uh, uh, by, by the Zoom. Uh, but... Uh, but but I don't mind because I hear your voice. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, this has been a very illuminating discussion, Prabhu. Yes. And I'm sure we could go on more and more. Yes, like, yes. Uh, we should wind up. Yes. Yeah. I'll try to summarize and maybe you can add some conclusion then if you would like to. Okay. So, we started discussing on the topic of the holy name and mantra chanting, and there, we discussed about how the, there is a intrinsic connection between the reference and the referent with respect to Krishna. Yeah. At the same time, there is our experience of Krishna may vary, uh, of divinity, not necessarily Krishna, of divinity may vary based mm-hmm. on our receptivity, our purity. So with respect to our names, there is no such intrinsic connection. Although our uh, receptivity also can determine how much we can manage, how much a name manifests, how much we feel the person's presence when we utter their name. Yes. So that's why chanting, when it becomes mechanical, one reason for it is that we are not connected it with the person. So the more we connect the nama with the uh, with the rupa, the, leel, the the dhama, the leela, the guna, then the more yeah. it will become personal. That's right. And then I think from that point, we had further discussions, of course, but from that point, we went to the idea of this disconnection or reductionism with respect mm-hmm. to chanting. And so at one level, it is said that oh, the Holy Name is non-different from Krishna. Divinity is fully manifested in their names. And another level, our uh, our consciousness matter. There are offenses. So I think the whole discussion took a delightful detour from that point when you redefined, uh, redefined uh, reduc- uh, Aparad as reductionism. The essence of Aparad is reductionism. So we may overvalue things and that's idolatry. We devalue things and that is blasphemy. And then, so there, uh, when you're talking about uh, to, the, to devalue the inst- we discuss some offenses to the holy name, like equating it with the names of quasi-divinities. That is also a nice word, uh, yeah. quasi-divinities. Or we, we are disrespectful of the instruction of the spiritual master. And then we came to the topic of offending devotees. That is also reductionism. And then we went into a different direction. So when we offend devotees, criticizing is not necessarily offending. If it is constructive criticism, the key to constructive criticism is the readiness for dialogue. Mm. So divorce from dialogue, just make a statement and leave it at that. So also aparad, it's offense is not a precise translation because offense is more a result of of aparad somebody gets offended but it is aparad is more of uh, the whole mentality of everything that is embodied by reductionism it's one's attitude it's one dealing with the particular object and it's the result of that dealing everything right. that we claim with reductionism then it discussed about when we are looking at dealing with devotees so you mentioned this point that if somebody uh, somebody wants to have a dialogue a person leadership position should it has an obligation to respond say if they're offering some criticism because otherwise they don't i mean they shouldn't be taking that position because if there are concerns they need to be addressed 
so of course there are degrees if somebody is uh, somebody is uh, just finding faults for the sake of finding faults you differentiated between jealousy and envy later but that's related jealousy is more if somebody has something i also want to have it and once i have it that jealousy goes away but envy is evil where the only way i'll be satisfied is when what the other person has is taken away from them and they become unhappy they're made unhappy so when we talk about uh, dialoguing with others the purpose is uh, it's to foster a, not only a better understanding of each other anyakar as you said uh, ahanka anyakar and then param anyakar it's also to foster a better understanding of krishna because we all Uh, perceive krishna from different perspectives then i brought this point about you know how the devotee said my opinion doesn't matter is inconsequential but it is shastra vichar that matters what is scripture say so you i loved this phrase you know what i will i'll remember many things but this one thing is that no one just goes to scripture we bring something to scripture and what we bring to scripture determines what we take from scripture so in that sense uh, the we can say the word subjective might seem an authoritative but the word we will to use the word adhikar so according to our adhikar we will see scripture we will see scripture accordingly and if in the name of erasing the i we may actually be emphasizing the i because if we say this is the reality that means i am playing god in one sense right because what i'm saying is that uh, this there is nothing more to this than than this so i'm presu- if i'm saying shastra vichar i'm presuming i know all of scripture and all the way in which scripture can have a bearing on this issue so we can bring the i in a mood of humility and that's actually is uh, essential for for you could say authenticity so then we discussed about the, the mood of dialogue in various ways how this uh, hermeneutic no epistemology of the heart that how when the, when the heart opens when the, there is openness of the heart and krishna manifests and then two people can discuss and then there is two devotees can discuss and there is satisfaction and then there is ecstasy beyond that so at one level uh, limit we are limited by our finitude but the way to come out of our our finite perceptions in a sense or the way to avoid uh, our existential limitedness is through dialogue so then our perspectives expand and while we would like to have naturally dialogue with like minded devotees we need to be discerning about with whom what level of dialogues we can have but sometimes even if somebody is reluctant we can explore a deeper and the subject can be a launching pad for mutual understanding and that way so i mentioned about how the scripture yes there there could be a teaching dialogue which is what is in bhagavatam and the and the bhagavad gita but there are dialogues of very different forms and chetan charitamrita embodies such dialogues so dialogue is the antidote to what was it is said narrow mindedness or to limitedness to our the, to our conditioned perception we could say dialogue right. is the antidote to reductionism and the conditioned perception thereof beautiful it is beautiful thank you bro this is a this is a, all our discussions are delightful this is unexpectedly delightful <laughs> <laughs> well i i like the uh, uh i i like the sort of shock value of yeah. f- further bringing us both into wonderful ways of appreciating the richness of our extraordinary tradition yeah. our extraordinary tradition so you're a, you're an excellent person uh to dialogue with to discover these very rich points so i thank you for that chaitanya charan ji honored to have your association for that you're sparing your time and uh the way i think there are three things you know there is you love words i also very very love words so we have we we have that like minded articulation and and you also quite inclusive and broad minded and i also try to be do that and then we also have 
uh, many things, but a significant level of concern for how people pursue shastra rather than scripture alone. Yeah. You know that. So that there are many things which we gel. But I think I was thinking, you know, among the many dialogues, I have a different devotees. I would say I relish a dialogue probably among the most, if not the most. And I love your articulation. I love your broad. broad mindedness you bring to scripture and also i love your sensitivity to to you could say humanity or the human heart to the human side of bhakti so thank yes. you very much for your association and i look forward to having future dialogues once again in Wonderful. the near future you are very you are a very sweet hearted and at the same time very knowledgeable and inspiring devotee to so many i've i've heard from i mean i they just love your your dialogues i've heard nothing from anyone but good things so please keep going thank you very much and with and 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 then include me every once in a while oh yes definitely i look forward to it <laughs> thank good. you